Aloha and uh, welcome to another episode of Condo Insider on Think Tech Hawaii. And today I'm your host, Jane Sugimura. And today uh, the, we're going to be discussing uh, the aftermath of uh, the Surfside condo collapse and what different uh, jurisdictions are doing. And, you know, as my guest, I have uh, Richard Emery. Uh, who's very active in CIA and uh, the national organization. Uh, welcome, Richard. Well, thank you for having me. It's uh, uh, the uh, surf side or the Champagne Towers South collapse has certainly created a lot of buzz in the industry about what to do about it and reserve studies and other issues. And somehow, and, and you're on the national, uh, you're on the, one of the national boards that are dealing with this, right? Well, Community Association Institute, CAI, uh, establishes on many areas, not just reserve studies, public policy. The public policy helps guide boards of directors, but also uh, it's used with legislators to help promote better legislation. And after the Surfside collapse, they established a special task force of reserve specialists. And as you know, I'm a reserve specialist. I was one of the first in the country in and help co-author part of Hawaii's condominium law. And so I was asked to be on the task, the national task force. So I've been attending meetings and it's been quite interesting because you're hearing from many jurisdictions, many states and, and the different approaches and different thoughts on how uh, this should impact uh, reserve study policy. So the different jurisdictions that are involved, can you uh, tell us you know, where they are and do they all, do some or all of them have a reserve study law? Well, you know, if you look at the 50 American states, there's only 15 states that have any legislation that has to do with reserve studies. And when I say that, Hawaii is very robust in its law, where many states are very nominal what they have to say. It doesn't have much content uh, to the reserve study issue. So, uh, we're hearing from those states that have nothing as well as those states that uh, have uh, certain laws trying to determine what the best public policy should be for condominium and homeowner associations. And so uh, what has what, what kind of discussions have, have, have been going on? I mean, are you talking about new legislation or uh, or, or nationwide policy or? Well, this would be a nationwide public policy that each state could use to work with its legislature and its stakeholders to develop meaningful laws. And basically, the, there's, I'm going to say there's um, six areas we've been discussing. I'll just briefly give you each area. If you want, we can go into yes. each one. Okay. Number one is, should a reserve study be required? Of course, that throws out the size of the condo versus a homeowner association versus the condo association. Then number two, uh, should it be for all associations, co-ops, plan unit developments, those types of things. So the number two issue is who should the uh, reserve study laws include? Number three, who should prepare it? Should it be a mandatory that it be a licensed professional or a, or a credentialed professional to prepare it? And number four, and really the, the sticky wicket and all this, uh, believe it or not, in certain states like Florida, where the surfside collapse occurred, they have a provision in their condo law that allows the homeowners to opt out of the reserve study obligation. And so the question is whether or not that should be part of the public policy, uh, the opt out. And then finally, uh, the last two are enforcement. Well, what do you do about enforcing the law? Because certainly, uh, if it's too arduous, you may not get people to serve on boards of directors. And then finally, the, everybody's kind of in agreement that the big issue is uh, developers' obligations on new projects. You may not know that there's something called a preliminary reserve study, which is differently structured than a uh, reserve study established condos have, that is more designed towards um, uh, developers and and should that be mandatory, developers are part of their public report in Hawaii's case have to have a preliminary reserve study. And those are the six areas that the, the task force is discussing. And so what's going to come out of these discussions? 
hopefully well, some kind of policy that uh, all states can use? Well, we certainly recognize it's hard to have a, well, there could be national legislation on this. No one really knows. There's, there's a, uh, and I want to get more into the surf side a little later on in the show, but, uh, but what, uh, we, we've done surveys on the task force and, and we've uh, done surveys as CAI and, uh, and the public policy is currently being, I've seen several drafts uh, is being fine tuned, but I would summarize it as follows that everybody agrees that a reserve study should be an obligation of a condominium association and all associations, meaning homeowner association and plan unit developments and, and uh, co-ops, for example, that every association have to, should have to have a reserve study. Mm -hmm. the, the question on who prepares a reserve study, we all believe that associations of substance are better served by having a licensed credential professional prepare the reserve study. So it will be a recommendation versus being a mandate. So therefore, the two or four unit condominium in uh, may not be forced with the cost of hiring a professional. I own in a 20 unit condominium and, and the way it's structured, it's a CPR and single family homes. The really only common element is the road. Should that 20 unit association who has a reserve study with a single component based on a vendor's estimated cost, should they be forced with the cost of hiring a credential professional? So the idea, I think, within the task force is to recommend credential prof professionals when the association's size and scope is sufficient enough uh, to warrant the expense. Of course, that leaves open for someone's interpretation what they think that may be. Um, everybody's in agreement that you should not be able to opt out of the reserve study obligations, that everybody should know, owners are entitled to know what the costs are, uh, boards have a fiduciary duty to maintain the property. Uh, you shouldn't be able to opt out uh, as what happened in Surfside. We'll get back into the specifics of Surfside if you want. Then enforcement, you have to have a means of enforcement, but to try to put the obligation onto boards, you know, boards change every year. And so reserve studies are a living document that goes year after year to try to put some kind of economic burden on board members who don't do the reserve study exactly correctly would open ourselves to huge amounts of litigation and problems. So people are uh, more inclined to have an enforcement provision to make you do a reserve study, but not so much a penalty if it turns out you're wrong unless you've done something in bad faith or something along that line. And then everybody's in agreement that the developer should have to do a um, preliminary reserve study, it's called. It's different than uh, the working document we use in condos, for example. The preliminary reserve study recognizing it's a new development. So the amount of detail in some of that work is quite different than uh, than uh, um, a regular reserve study for an active ongoing project. So that's kind of the, the gist of what the public policy will finally say. It will address those specific issues. Okay, and when do you think that the, the, there's gonna, the, this uh, um, policy is gonna be completed or a re agreement's gonna be reached on, uh, as to what the policy is gonna be? I would suggest that the final draft will be done um, by mid-September at the latest, if not earlier. Then we will go out to the stakeholders through CAI for comments. And then it'll be presented to the, their board for approval and adoption by year's end, I would suspect. And, um, but in, in, in this context, is it contemplated that this policy will then be used to uh, initiate new legislation? Yes. One of the primary purposes of the public policy is to help the local chapter, like we have a Hawaii chapter of CAI, uh, promote positive legislation. And, and, and I hate to say it, but in Hawaii, you know, we don't have the problems the other states have. We have a robust program, which I can go into. But the reality is I'm going to suspect that our legislature, you're going to have people 
throwing out legislation this year uh, trying to address a problem they don't understand. And by having public policy, it gives us a working document to talk to the legislature about uh, so they don't go off on a, on a wrongful tangent. Because personally, I don't think we need more legislation on this topic in Hawaii. And, uh, you know, with respect to um, what, what happened in Florida, and I, I understand that the legislators there are looking at their state laws and, and trying to figure out, you know, what they can do to avoid another situation like what happened at the uh, uh, Surfside condo. Uh, so what's, what, what, what's happening in, in Florida that's different than what's happening in the rest of the country? Well, let's, let's talk about the surf side for a second. And let's talk about reserve studies from this perspective. Let's remember what the national definition of a reserve study is. It is a budgeting tool. It's a tool to use for boards to collect money for future maintenance and repairs. What it is not is a quality inspection of the project. You may hire an engineer because you have a problem with spalling and cracking. But that's nearly the only part of that that becomes a part of the reserve study would be funding it and putting in the reserve study when you're going to replace it. So the reserve study law, we have to keep it in context, but the reserve study law is designed as a budgeting tool to allow boards to plan for the future. So they don't have to have a special assessment or loan to deal with things that are defined in the component inventory of the reserve study. The problem you have with Surfside is they had structural engineering reports saying that they had problems. And the problem was a over $15 million repair, as you remember. Well, that's really not a part of the reserve study. I mean, reserve specialists are not qualified to do quality inspections of the project. When you see you have problems in a condo, you should hire an engineer or an architect or someone who's skilled at that particular field. And so, um, that and funding, are, they're, they're kind of like two different issues. And we don't want to see that the reserve study budgeting tool get mixed up with when you have a problem and you have to hire the, the building doctor to fix it, that um, that's what you're going to do. The county next to Surfside County, what they recently adopted was an ordinance that said the following, that if you are a condo and you do a building inspection by a licensed engineer, when you get your report, you have to give a copy to the building department. And I guess the idea behind that is that that would allow the county to see if, if you have problems and to the extent that they want to send their inspectors out, whatever it may be. So that was the county next door with what with, 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 with they chose to, chose to do to kind of address this issue. So I think we're going to see a, whole lot of approaches from different states and different, different counties on, uh, on how to address this. But as an industry, we want to keep it clear in the legislator's mind, the difference between a budgeting tool and kind of planning for raising money to pay for this versus making it that we have some kind of obligation. Because, you know, we had a bill maybe two years ago, three years ago, where they were trying to force condos. I want to say it was every five years to do engineering inspections. Right, we that was the know. building envelope. That was the building envelope inspection at uh, the the city and county was had the ordinance. You know, we basically believe in self governance. That associations need to look at this. Every building is different in a way, and the boards, are, uh, if they choose to think they have a problem, they should hire a licensed professional to deal with it and address it appropriately. Once they've been given knowledge through that inspection or through that credentialed person then they need to include it in the reserve study because if they have that problem, they've got to start looking at, at how they're going to fund it. So uh, uh, I, I think you're going to see a whole lot of legislation that doesn't really fully understand the problem and uh, are going to try to impose all sorts of preventive measures, which are mean it's going to be expensive. And it's going to cost everybody a lot of money. And I think in Hawaii, the ordinance on the fire sprinkler system is a perfect example of one that really hasn't gone that well, the best intentions, but, it really hasn't gone that well. And that one has resulted in unintended consequences that have made it more expensive for condominiums who have to do these repairs to bring their buildings up to stuff. You know, it, 
if you look at the surf side from another issue, it, it, and I'm going to give you my perspective of what went wrong with the surf side. I think we would all agree we don't have a national problem where buildings are falling down all over the place. I think this is the first one I've heard of of being in, in the industry for almost 30 years. So when, when, you, when you look at the surf side, first of all, you have a design problem. The way the building was designed, where the pool was located, how it was supported, makes it more vulnerable than the average condominium to fall down. If you don't attend to its, uh, its spalling and its structural issues. So the, you had a building that had a unique design that in some ways could argue that if you had started to have failures and didn't attend to these things early, which they did not, that in fact, you were more likely to have a problem like this than other buildings would have. Number two, you look at the fact that the board identified this several years ago, but the Florida laws allow owners to opt out of it. So, you know, here they're suing the board or suing the association as all these lawsuits, but I'm sure the board's defense is going to be, we tried to get the owners to approve it and they voted to opt out of it. Under Florida law, we don't have the ability to shove it down their throat. You know, in Hawaii, we basically have the shove it down your throat method. They have a legal obligation to do it. And they can assess everybody whether they like it or not. Yeah, if they want a loan, they have to get their consent. But we don't have this opt-out provision that, that exists in Florida. So here you have residents suing the board saying you didn't do the job. But meanwhile, the owners wouldn't let them do the job. And then the law allows you to opt out of it. And then finally, you may remember the uh, newspaper reports saying that the building department came and looked at it and said, it's not that bad. So it's going to be a mess, but I don't think we should overreact to a single incident that had all these extraneous parts to it, particularly in Hawaii, because our law is much more robust than any law. In fact, I sent to the task force our law, our administrative rules. You may not know it when our law first came out. I think it was adopted in 1995, effective day January 1, 2000. Uh, the DCCA put out in 1992 the Condominium Reserve Reference Manual. It's probably about 200 pages thick, if I remember correctly. So we've had a lot more experience than most of these other locales on dealing with reserve study issues. And we have a much more robust law. You have to address these issues. You can't opt out of it. And yeah, I would be less than honest if I didn't tell you. I see reserve studies that are marginal, in my opinion, the reserves of the boards don't want to look at this thing seriously, but I've never seen a board and there's a structural problem not address it. But you know, the problem with Surfside and, and probably with in, in Hawaii too, even if you have the best reserve study and you know, you have a board who's willing, ready, willing and able to do, you know, make those hard decisions. You've got a group of owners who, who just, really don't want to pay or they claim that they have financial issues and don't want to support the uh, recommendations of the board regarding you know this expensive repair like spalling it's interesting you say that because i have a case you know i do some expert witness work uh, i have a case right now where a, a condominium um, has these exterior decks with drains and uh, the system is failing. If you saw the pictures, you'd see it's failing. And so the board, frankly, reserved the money and have the money to, to fix it in cash. And one of the owners on the first floor has filed a lawsuit against the association trying to prevent them from being able to fix it, saying it's unfair that she pays for the waterproofing on an upper floor deck because she lives in the first floor and she doesn't have a deck. Well, the question is, well, the leak goes into her apartment, right? There are leaks in this particular project, but she's saying, no, the way the governing documents are written, it's, it's, it's really uh, uh, the deck is a finished flooring, not a waterproofing membrane, and, and it's filed a suit. because. And, and the odd thing about that is there is no special assessment. The board has been collecting money for the deck replacement for years. And we're dealing with an owner who just says, I'm being treated unfairly and it's involved in litigation. So you have a good point. I think part of the problem is we, we kind of 
don't message this well to the members and the owners. You know, we don't talk enough about it. And maybe Surfside will be the catalyst to get us to talk more about it, that we have these obligations we have to undertake. And it's not just structural issues of the building falling down. You have the issues of all these waste boiler pipes failing, for example. You may have windows falling out that creates problems for your insurance and liability. And you, you, you can't keep sticking your head in the sand. At some point in time, you have to realize you have a common interest and a common share in the structural integrity and the integrity of that building. And I think we have to message it better to all the condo owners and boards. And, and, and so that means, you know, uh, educating them like Condo Insider is trying to do with these shows. For sure. You know, I'm, I'm an expert in about three or four lawsuits against developers where, you know, developers by statute have to put out a public report. The public report in simple words says they have to give you an accurate estimate of maintenance fees. But then within the condo law in Hawaii, it says that developers don't have to do a reserve study until the first full year after the association been turned over to the owners. So the question becomes, how does a developer estimate the maintenance fees if they don't know what the reserves are? Well, a lot of them fall back on the FHA mortgage lending requirements and just say, I'm going to use 10% of maintenance fees. Well, the FHA lending requirements don't quite say that. It's 10% of income. So if they're sub-metering electricity, for example, they'd have to have 10% of that too. It's the FHA is 10% of all income, not just maintenance fees, which can be moved around depending on how you structure the master association dues, whatever. You could manipulate that number. The problem with that concept in Hawaii is the administrative rules that a statute provide for that as a means to do reserve calculations. So it's, 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 it's a false number that really reduces the true number that you need for a reserve study. In the cases I've seen, we've seen the reserve obligations go up 300% from the public report because they just used this uh, low ball 10% number of the FHA lending requirements. And so I think we need to go out to the developers and we need to educate them as well. You know, that uh, maybe uh, some revisions to the law with regard to doing a preliminary reserve study versus they don't have to do one because they. Would you, would you right? recommend that as, as, as something that the state legislature uh, uh, would, would be required, or would, you know, require the developers of new condominiums to do this preliminary reserve study? Yes. Yeah, so if you think about a public report, it takes us honest, innocent public and, and you're a buyer for the first time, let's say, and you want to know what you have to pay. You have a budget, you have, kids in school and everything else, you should have a right to know what the legitimate costs are going to be. And to that extent, you know, the public report today, the law says you have to give an accurate estimate. Well, how does the developer give an accurate estimate without doing some kind of due diligence? I mean, you can look at, uh, uh, I have a database of uh, a lot of condominiums, a huge number of condominiums in Hawaii, and what they're paying for per, on a, on a, per reserve contribution per unit um, based on certain size and other criteria. And I can tell you now that for a high rise condo in Hawaii, over 10 stories, the average is between 150 and $200 a month is the reserve contribution. So I would look at a Republic report that shows $35 a month. It makes me wonder how they came with that number. Then you look at how they, they kind of calculated the estimate of maintenance fees it was steered, in my opinion, to low maintenance fees and didn't accurately describe it. So I would certainly welcome legislation or changing in the rules to address that so that buyers have a, a better understanding what they're what they're getting into when they buy a project. But you know, Richard, you know, earlier you 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 indicated that you would not make any recommendation to local legislators uh, to uh, make any changes because of the Surfside condominium collapse. And I kind of agree with you because, I mean, we had an ordinance in the city and county of Honolulu that was uh, passed basically because we had a fire. We had a horrific fire at the Marco Polo. And because of that, we ended up with this ordinance that basically said, you shall install fire sprinklers in high rise buildings. In other words, we had to retrofit or you could do the alternative and pass a life safety evaluation. And what happened 
I mean, I, I and and I know that the mayor passed, you know, wanted the, that law passed because of the, the the injuries and the death that occurred in the Marco Polo fire, and and I, I I agree with him to that extent, but I I disagreed with the law. That's why we went and asked for an alternative to installing fire sprinklers. But now we have a in situation where the insurance for all the condominiums in in in, in the state have gone up. And the people who have to comply now with the alternative, the life safety evaluation, they got to scramble for millions of dollars to pay for those repairs. And so I guess that's what the concern is with, with, the, with this condo collapse in Florida. What, 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 and I've had calls from legislators saying, what can we do? What can we do? And I basically told them, uh, right now, let's not do anything because we have a reserve, a budget and reserves law that has been in effect for 30 years and we just and we've been educating the uh, associations and we just got to do a better job and make sure that word gets out do you agree with that i do agree with that i would say this about the fire sprinkler because i was on that task force too that you know my whole thing was okay we want to protect the people right just mandate everybody meet the current code on fire alarm systems then they can get out and not you may have a fire but I don't know how you put in some of these buildings a 10 by 10 room for the fire pump. It gets to be twenty, thirty thousand dollars a unit. The building that was built to the building code at that time. So I was never a big fan of mandating uh, fire sprinklers. I was kind of a fan of providing tax benefits and tax relief if you did do it. But I think you've opened up a box of something that'll that will never get resolved. I don't think the buildings will do it. Uh, they have the right to opt out of the fire sprinkler thing here in Hawaii. And I, I agree with that because I think it's too burdensome. And, and, and really ask yourself, and I've lived here in Hawaii 41 years, 42, 46 years. Um, I haven't seen that many big high-rise condo fires. I've seen more residential fires. So why don't we have every residential home has to have a fire sprinkler? So I don't want to see the uh, legislators have this thing sometimes that they have to save the day and give us all these things to protect the world and the public. Well, I don't think we can allow that to happen. I think we have to look, I certainly know we would agree that we can review our reserve law as to the developers and some other things uh, and maybe clean it up a little bit, but I don't think we have a big problem in a way. Right, and the people that, I, I, I did get a call from the, the speaker, I got calls from the city council when, 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 when the condo collapse happened. And I said, you know, 30 years ago, when they passed the budget in reserve, uh, it was Macy Hirono. She was, a, she was in the House of uh, Representatives. She was a chair of the uh, CPC, Consumer Protection. And she, she was the one who passed it. The, the state of Hawaii, DCCA, they hired somebody at UH to prepare that manual that you spoke about. And in fact, I went and looked for it and I found it and I sent copies of it to, to the legislators who call, were calling me. I said, look, we got the stuff we just have to, you know, enforce it, you know, get people to get serious about it. I mean, and, and we don't need any more new laws. And so far, I think the people are, the legislators are listening. So I'm glad to hear that you are on the same page. And hopefully when, when this national policy, when CAI finishes this national policy, we can trot that out and, and circulate it to the, to the legislators and, and, and basically say, hey, we, we got a very robust budget and reserves law. You guys should be, you know, grateful that you, that somebody 30 years ago passed it. And we, maybe we have to beef it up, but hey, we don't have to make major changes in the law to, that, that are gonna affect uh, existing associations. Yeah, my testimony to them would be, we have the most robust reserve law in the country. If there's any area we need to address would be the developer's public reports. And that's basically how I look at it. And, and um, uh, we just don't have the level. And when I listen to the other states, how weak some of their laws are and all these options, we're, we're pretty strict. You have to provide a reserve study and it has to meet this criteria and the criteria matches national standards. So when the public policy comes out, other than maybe the developer issue we talked about, we're going to be able to say to the legislature, we already meet or exceed that. That's good. Okay, well, we've come to the end of uh, uh, our time. And thank you very much for being our guest uh, 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 for today's show. And you're going to be the host next week, right? That's correct. So um, for those listeners, 
you know, thank you for, uh, for joining us for this episode. And please tune in next week. And Richard Emery will be your host for the next episode of Kanon Cider. So thank you for being with us today. Mahalo and aloha. <laughs>